Hi, I'm Faye Hadley, and I'm here to talk about another break myth brought to you by my friends at PowerStop. And today's myth is brake rotors do not warp. This myth was inspired by so many of your incredibly thoughtful comments and questions on my last video on bedding or burnishing your brakes. And yes, those words are interchangeable, by the way. So let's dive in. What the heck is a warped rotor? Now, when I or any other technician tell you that your brake rotors have become warped, what do we mean by that? Well, we mean that your brake rotors are wobbling or not running true when rotating. And this could be caused by several different things. You could have excessive brake rotor lateral runout. You could have brake disc thickness variation. Or in some very rare cases, actually, your brake rotors could become the true meaning of the word warped, as in physically bent, but this is much less common than the catch-all term of warped rotors may lead you to believe. And these conditions will all have a similar set of symptoms. You're gonna get that steering wheel vibration when you're braking, or you might feel shaking in the seat, most often in the case of an issue with the rear brakes. You could also get that brake pedal pulsation, right? And then there are some other things that, that could happen. You could have some noise associated with it. You could also experience some pulling, but not always. And sometimes you'll experience an increased stopping distance, but really it's, it's that shaking and the pulsations that identify a warped rotor. So let's examine each one of these causes of warped rotors and discuss how it occurs and thus how we can prevent it in the first place. And perhaps most importantly to the busting of this myth, how can we measure them so you can have real proof that this phenomenon actually occurs? So first, excessive brake rotor lateral runout. Well, I mean, that's a mouthful, right? So I'm sure you can see why the term warped rotors is a far more uh, customer friendly, I guess, an accessible way to describe this one. So this refers to the variation of the brake rotor on the lateral surface, which is this surface right here, right, as opposed to the radial surface, which is this surface right here. And that, that makes sense, right? Because if we think radial, often we think of tires, which kind of corresponds to this outer edge, right? But lateral face, the lateral surface is, is this side right here. And this face should be completely flat in relation to the brake pads. So when the calipers squeeze the pads down against the rotor, smooth, even, controlled braking occurs, right? Now, if there is excessive variability in this surface, that's when the driver will begin to experience brake pedal pulsations and shaking in their steering wheel or their seat. And excessive is relative, of course, and varies depending on the size and the type of vehicle, as well as the manufacturer. So be sure to check your specs prior to taking measurements, but you'll typically see two thousandths of an inch to five thousandths of an inch is considered like acceptable runout numbers. So the power shop spec for runout is three thousandths maximum. And to measure the lateral runout, you can see that I'm starting with all of my lug nuts installed and they are torqued to 30 foot pounds. We'll use a dial indicator mounted on a fixed surface. You can use a clamp style like this, or a magnetic base style like this. And the tool that you choose and the location that works out best is definitely gonna depend on the vehicle itself. Now, on my Mark V Supra, all the suspension components are aluminum, so the magnetic base type is not gonna work very well on that car. But on my Mark III Supra, the magnetic base can fit well in a variety of places. Now, I like to place the plunger of the dial indicator about a half an inch to an inch from the outer edge, and then I'll turn the rotor a full 360 degrees, just making sure that the plunger contacts the solid surface of the rotor all the way around. And this step is especially important in the case of the power stop drilled and slotted rotors. And I'll take note of the lowest measurement on the dial, then I rotate the face of the dial indicator so that the zero is on or as close to that lowest point as possible, which is also called the trough. I'll just make a visual. That way we can see the highest number reached or the peak and thus the run out. It just makes it easiest for me to read. Then I'll rotate the rotor 360 degrees again and observe my readings. Of course, some people are really good at math and they can eyeball the run out specs without actually setting the zero. So you do whatever works best for you. Now, I highly recommend cleaning the hub and the rotor mating surfaces before you perform this measurement, especially for my northern friends who have rust to contend with. Because really, any buildup of dirt, debris, or rust on the surface can skew your measurements and give you a false reading. Now, if you notice excessive runout, I do recommend that you start by removing the rotor and repositioning it. I like to re-index the rotor by one lug and measure the runout again, but also mark the original location and just see if installation position has any effect on runout. Now, if the runout changes, then this could be indicative of excessive runout being on the hub surface rather than the rotor itself, 
So remove the rotor again and check for hub runout. Next up, brake disc thickness variation or DTV. This one's a little bit more self-explanatory, right? So the brake disc has different thicknesses all the way around its circumference, which are out of specification. But still, if I'm talking to a customer, hey, your rotors are warped versus, so I found excessive thickness variation in your brake rotors. Catch my drift? <laughs> I hope you're starting to see now why this colloquial phrase has been adopted by both technicians and hobbyists alike. It's just a general term that's given to a specific set of symptoms that are all sort of caused in the same ways. And much like having excessive lateral run out, the thickness variation in the rotor will cause uneven braking, shaking in the steering wheel or seat, and hydraulic feedback to the brake pedal, resulting in those disconcerting pulsations. This is because when the rotor spins, the distance between the brake pads and the rotors changes, sometimes multiple times within each rotation. This causes the brake pads to be pushed apart back into the caliper a little bit, then in another fraction of a second, suddenly they had extra space to take back up, right? So the caliper pistons are forced to retract slightly, then re-extend over and over and over again, so the friction force isn't consistent. And this is most often a direct result of a failure to properly bed in your new pads and rotors. So to measure disc brake thickness variation, I will be using this brake rotor micrometer, and I'll, I'll link this in the description of this video, but really any micrometer will do. I, I have seen some folks try to use a digital caliper, but that really doesn't work because you're almost always gonna have a little lip here at the outer edge of the rotor, so you won't be able to get an accurate reading. You need this specific shape, which allows you to measure accurately only at the point where the jaws come together. Now, we're gonna take a minimum of six measurements around the rotor. Different manufacturers will have, of course, different tolerances, but they'll also specify where and how many measurements you'll need to take across the rotor. I'm gonna use this Toyota measurement worksheet because this is what I'm familiar with. And you can see that we need to divide the rotor into six sections and come about 10 millimeters in from the edge to take our measurements. Now, once we get all six readings, we're gonna take the thickest measurement and subtract the thinnest measurement, and that will give us our thickness variation. Toyota specifies that if the difference between any two Two measurements exceeds eight ten thousandths of an inch, then the brake disc has to be machined or replaced. This may sound excessive, but keep in mind that even teeny tiny differences can cause noticeable vibrations at high speeds. The power stop specification for DTV is five ten thousandths of an inch maximum. And I think that now would be a good time to mention too that power stop actually measures both the runout and DTV of their rotors using this super cool computerized tester that basically maps the rotor surface. And I'm gonna play a little clip of that right now so you can see what that looks like. Very cool, very precise. Lastly, let's talk about the physical bending of the rotor itself, which most of you probably picture in your heads when I say the phrase, your rotors are warped. This is actually an extremely rare occurrence and really only happens if there is some sort of defect with the rotor or in a truly extreme heat sort of situation that you'd really only find in the toughest of motorsports. While not impossible, when I tell you that your brake rotors are warped, most of the time, like 99% of the time, I'm telling you that you have DTV, brake disc thickness variation, or excessive lateral runout. So, now that we know what warped rotors are, what causes this to happen? Well, if you watched my last video in the series, then you already know that improper brake bedding is a major cause of DTV. I mean, brake pad material embedding itself unevenly into the rotor surface, I, that would most definitely cause thickness variation, wouldn't it? And also, from this perspective, do you always need to replace the rotors or could you potentially resurface them? Well, that's another topic for another time. Now, excessive heating and cooling of the brakes is another cause. Driving with your e-brake accidentally engaged for a prolonged period of time, or you've probably heard the phrase riding the brakes. Actually, recently when I was in France cycling through the Alps with my dad, let me tell you the horrific, horrific brake smell that I experienced as we descended the Alps d'Huez. I mean, not from the bike, thank goodness, but from a car that was passing us. And as you go down, there are signs all the way down the mountain that say, use low gear. And there's like little pull-offs where you can cool your brakes in designated areas. And they also had like non-potable water stations. 
Although, do you think that just dumping cold glacial runoff water onto your overheating brakes is the best idea either? I mean, that unevenly applied extreme temperature differential, that can be very damaging. So that, that's kind of what I mean when I say excessive cooling. And this could also happen if, uh, if you like heat up the brakes a lot and then maybe drive through a really deep puddle, for example. Um, low quality, low quality or like thin rotors can cause, or maybe even good rotors that were machined too many times and now are below minimum specification. I mean, rotors also dissipate heat, right? That's one of the primary functions of the PowerStop drilled and slotted high performance rotors. So if an excessive amount of material has been machined off of the rotor and it becomes thinner, well, that limits the ability to properly absorb and dissipate heat and can lead to premature warpage. Uh, stuck or seized brake calipers can also be another major issue. This can lead once again to overheating as well as uneven brake pad deposits on the rotor surface. Uh, another thing I already talked about was dirty, rusty, or somehow uneven hub mating surface. And then um, last but not least, and everybody's favorite, okay, which may end up being a topic for a future brake myth video since I got so many comments and questions debating this one, but Improper wheel lug torque, yes, can also lead to warped rotors. The rotor can distort when it is clamped unevenly to the hub, people, okay? But whatever. Let me know in the comments if you want me to talk about that. But thank you so much for watching this installment of Brake Myths, brought to you by my dear friends at PowerStop Brakes. I'm having a lot of fun with this series, and I'm really enjoying seeing everyone's comments and questions. So keep the conversation going, y'all, because... Literally, you were definitely the inspiration for this video, and I truly hope that you found it helpful and informative. And let me know if there are any other break myths that you would like me to cover in my next video. So yeah, thank you so much, and I will see you next time.